Paolo Freire's seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, radically altered the way many people think about education. For the left, it continues to be a guiding text on politicization and the development of critical thinking. Though one video is incapable of doing Freire's ideas justice, we will nevertheless take the time to look over some of the major concepts Freire contributed in his brief but powerful analysis of education and class consciousness. To begin with, let's reflect on the concept of conscientiazao. Conscientiazao refers to learning to perceive social, political, and economic contradictions, and to take action against the oppressive elements of reality. Sometimes translated as critical consciousness in English, the central concept reflects Freire's insistence on the interconnectedness of theory and practice. Developing critical consciousness, for Freire, is not just about learning how to ask the right questions. It is equally about applying one's findings to alter material and social circumstances. Naturally, achieving critical consciousness and facilitating its development in others is one of the primary focuses, if not the primary focus, of revolutionary movements. It is no coincidence that this primary focus is also among the most difficult tasks to accomplish. The path to critical consciousness is necessarily emancipatory, which carries a number of meanings. First, it means that critical consciousness cannot be imparted from one individual to another as a unidirectional and pseudo-charitable act. It also means that the individual working to develop critical consciousness must actively want to engage in an emancipatory practice, but this can be challenging because, as Freire writes, freedom can be a daunting concept. At the heart of Freire's argument is the idea of liberation as a humanizing process. This establishes a clear goal for humanity, a narrative of the human struggle for freedom. Those social forces that limit or regress the struggle for emancipation are characterized by Freire as dehumanizing. What is especially interesting in Freire's perspective is that the act of oppression is dehumanizing not only for the oppressed, but for the oppressors. In oppressing others, the oppressors engender in themselves violence, which strips them of their humanity. The great humanistic and historical task of the oppressed is then to liberate themselves and the oppressors as well. Oppressive social formations are powerful not only in their capacity to physically subjugate the oppressed, they are also powerful because they condition and shape the psyche of both the oppressors and the oppressed. This is manifested in the oppressed in their attempts at emancipation. Freire writes that the very structure of their thought has been conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete, existential situation by which they were shaped. Their ideal is to be men, but for them, to be men is to be oppressors. Implicitly, even the oppressed value oppression, because it's all they know. It's their lived experience. Breaking free of this mode of thinking is one of the obstacles in achieving emancipation. The oppressed suffer from the duality which has established itself in their innermost being. They discover that without freedom, they cannot exist authentically. Yet, although they desire authentic existence, they fear it. They are at one and at the same time themselves and the oppressor whose consciousness they have internalized. This is where Freire introduces the so-called pedagogy of the oppressed. Pedagogy, which refers to the theory and practice of teaching, must break the duality of the oppressed and deliver critical consciousness. But it cannot authentically do so without being developed with, not for, the oppressed. In other words, critical consciousness cannot be dictated from one person to another. What is needed is a critical pedagogy, one that departs from the socially ingrained oppressor-oppressed dynamic. Freire recognizes that the way we impart knowledge is very much a reflection of the top-down social relations of an oppressive society. He calls the conventional method of teaching the banking concept of education. In this method, there are clearly defined teacher and student roles. The teacher is seen as holding all of the knowledge, and throughout a series of lessons deposits this knowledge into the student as if depositing something into a bank. The teacher is the depositor, while the student is the receiver. The student is assumed to hold no knowledge of their own. Freire elaborates on this, saying, It is not surprising that the banking concept of education regards men as adaptable, manageable beings. The more students work at storing the deposits entrusted to them, the less they develop the critical consciousness which would result from their intervention in the world as transformers of that world. The more completely they accept the passive role imposed on them, the more they tend simply to adapt to the world, as it is, and to the fragmented view of reality deposited in them. Freire challenges the educational method with what he calls libertarian education. 
He argues that education must begin with the solution of the teacher-student contradiction, by reconciling the poles of the contradiction so that both are simultaneously teachers and students. Problem-posing education, which Freire uses somewhat interchangeably with libertarian education, breaks with the vertical pattern characteristic of banking education. To begin with, problem-posing education acknowledges that learning occurs collectively, that both the educator and the student are learning and teaching simultaneously. In this sense, both are active, and neither is passive in the learning process. Problem-posing education also asserts that the student is not an empty bank waiting to be filled, but a holder of knowledge as well. Freire draws on his experience of collective learning in Latin America, where revolutionary activists went out into communities to practice libertarian education. Instead of arriving with a suitcase full of jargon and didactic rhetoric, the educators carefully studied the communities. Learning sessions were driven by the community members who remarked on the real problems and observations accumulated through their lived experiences. The role of the educators was to eventually facilitate these discussions by posing problems, hence the term problem-posing education. The problems helped frame the discourse and facilitated a critical evaluation of the topic at hand. This was neither a smooth nor perfect process. Members of the community were often hesitant to make assertive claims due to their own insecurities. Having internalized the role of empty receivers, many were cautious and instinctively waited on the facilitator to deposit information. Overtly political topics were touchy as well. The learners found that, in not having engaged their creative capacities to think beyond the confines of their socio-political realities, it was difficult to even begin. Successful collective learning included what Freire calls thematic investigations and perpetual decoding. In short, the group deconstructed the world around them and meditated on each element together. This continuous dialogue demonstrated the horizontality of libertarian education, in contrast with the banking model. Dialogue is paramount in Freire's critical pedagogy. Dialogical interaction between the educator and the people stood in contrast to the anti-dialogics exemplified in the banking model. Apart from its inherent fluidity and interconnectivity, Freire distinguished dialogics from anti-dialogics in its manifestation of the unity of theory and practice. As Freire put it, the sacrifice of action is verbalism, whereas the sacrifice of reflection is activism. Libertarian education, being dialogical in nature, must embrace both thought and action. Dialogical activity seeks transformation of the world and reflects that objective in its deconstruction of the vertical relationship in the conventional method of learning. By contrast, anti-dialogical activity implicitly, and at times explicitly, rejects transformative projects or at least limits them. Freire describes the theory of oppressive action as anti-dialogical. The oppressors are concerned with various means by which to subjugate the oppressed. Among these are conquest, divide and rule, manipulation, and cultural invasion. Freire argues that once a situation of oppression has been initiated, anti-dialogue becomes indispensable to its preservation. The oppressors use a variety of ideological tools, many of which we are familiar with, to ensure that they maintain the social hierarchy. Freire gives a list of some of the myths that the oppressors deposit into society to legitimize and sanctify oppression. The myth that the oppressive order is a free society. The myth that all persons are free to work where they wish. That if they don't like their boss, they can leave him and look for another job. The myth that this order respects human rights and is therefore worth of esteem. The myth that anyone who is industrious can become an entrepreneur. Worse yet, the myth that the street vendor is as much an entrepreneur as the owner of a large factory. The myth of private property as fundamental to personal human development, as long as oppressors are the only true human beings. The myth of the industriousness of the oppressors and the laziness and the dishonesty of the oppressed, as well as the myth of the natural inferiority of the latter and the superiority of the former. Freire's work shines a light on several problems for the contemporary left. The first is the absence of humility as a fundamental element of dialogical action. Libertarian education requires that knowledge is not directed at people, but rather developed with them. In this sense, the question of converting the masses to correct ideology are misguided and cling, in Freire's terms, to the anti-dialogical arrogance of the banker clerk. Developing critical consciousness requires a collective and horizontal commitment, a dialogue that may be facilitated by the educator, but not in any capacity dictated. Challenging the banking method of education goes beyond interacting with the people. Even internally, many on the left enter discourse with others with the intention of conversion or persuasion. Both interlocutors fashion themselves as the teachers, wishing to impart their truth, 
Rarely do both individuals take on the teacher-student role and become learners concurrently. In beginning to practice the elements of libertarian education internally and in developing dialogical principles of action, the left may eventually teach itself how to help generate critical consciousness beyond its confines. Freire is abundantly clear in warning us that even a revolutionary claiming to be aligned with the people may regress towards or preserve anti-dialogical tendencies. A revolutionary theory of action, Freire says, can only be built through the encounter of the people with the revolutionary leaders, based on dialogically derived praxis. That brings us to the end of this video. Thank you all for watching, and a special thanks to everyone who continues to support this project on Patreon and beyond. We will leave you once again with the quote from Marx, perhaps more topical here than in any previous video. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point is to change it.